On this question, we want to evaluate the integral. We have the indefinite integral of 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus x minus 2 over x squared dx. So as we look at this example, um, I'm trying to decide what technique that I want to use. And I notice that I have a single term in the denominator. When I have a single term in the denominator, I can distribute that division to each one of the terms in the numerator. And when I have those individual terms, I might be able to use the power rule on those individual terms. So I'll start by doing that algebra first. That would be 2x cubed over x squared plus 3x squared over x squared plus x over x squared minus 2 over x squared. All of that dx. I'll simplify each one of these terms, and that will give me 2x plus 3 plus x to the negative 1 minus 2x to the negative 2. So these three terms, I'm going to be able to use the power rule to find the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of x to a power dx is x to one more than that power over one more than that power plus c. Now the only thing that I have to be careful of this is because this creates a fraction having a zero in the denominator. So when n is equal to negative 1, I'm not able to use the power rule. So on this term right here, I'm not able to use that power rule. Instead, I'm going to use um, the integral of 1 over x dx is natural log absolute value of x. So I can find the antiderivative of each one of these terms individually. And that first term has a power of 1. So using the power rule, I'll add 1 to that power and divide by the power. For this constant, that's like x to the 0 power. So I can add 1 and divide by 1. For this term, x to the negative 1, we're going to use that natural log rule, natural log absolute value of x. And then finally, I'm going to add 1 to negative 2 to get negative 1 over negative 1 plus c. I'll do a little bit of algebra cleanup, and that will be x squared plus 3x plus natural log absolute value of x. A negative and a negative make a plus and then I'll have 2 over x plus c. So we've now found the antiderivative of that expression. On this question, we want to evaluate the integral of 4x cubed plus square root of x plus 1 over x squared dx. I'm going to be using the power rule on this first term here. I'll also be using the power rule on these other two terms as well. But before I do that, I need to rewrite this radical as an exponent and rewrite this um, variable in the denominator to move it up to the numerator. So I'm going to be using those exponent properties to rewrite these terms as a power. Square root of x is the same thing as x to the 1 half power. And using my properties of negative exponents, 1 over x squared is x to the negative 2. And now I'll be able to use the power rule, the antiderivative power rule, on every one of these terms individually. So 4 is a constant multiple. I'll carry that down. And on x squared, I'll add 1 to the power and divide by that power. I'm going to use the power rule on x to the 1 half. I want to add 1 to that power and divide by that power. 
and do the same thing for this last term. Add 1 to negative 2 and divide by that power. And of course we need our plus c because the derivative of a constant is 0. And we'll do a little bit of cleanup here. The 4's cancel and we have x to the 4th. 1 half plus 1 would be 3 halves. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. And for this fraction that I'm dividing by, I'll multiply by the reciprocal. That gives x to the 4th plus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. That becomes a minus 1 over x plus c. So we found our antiderivative to be x to the 4th plus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus 1 half, excuse me, 1 over x plus c. On this question, we want to use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the limit. We have the limit as x approaches infinity of 5x squared minus 4x plus 1 over 2x cubed plus x minus 7. So we're going to start by substituting the infinity in. And that would give 5 times infinity squared minus 4 times infinity plus 1 over 2 times infinity cubed plus infinity minus 7. And in this numerator, you can see that infinity squared will still be infinity, and 5 times infinity will still be infinity. Even if I take this away, it will still be infinity. If I add 1, it's still infinity. So I get infinity in the numerator. The same thing happens in the denominator. We get infinity. This is an indeterminate form, and having that indeterminate form is what allows us to um, use L'Hopital's rule. So then L'Hopital's rule says that we can simplify this limit by calculating the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. So we're now going to apply the limit as x approaches infinity and calculate the derivative. That's 10x minus 4 over 6x squared plus 1. And when we apply this limit, we would plug the infinity in 10 times infinity minus 4 over 6 times infinity squared plus 1. And this would give us, once again, infinity over infinity. But because we got the indeterminate form again, we can now apply L'Hopital's rule for a second time, calculating the derivative again of these two values. So now we have the limit as x approaches infinity. The derivative of 10x minus 4 is 10. The derivative of 6x squared plus 1 is 12x. And now when I apply the limit, we're having infinity in the denominator. We have a fixed number in the numerator and infinity in the denominator. This is going to approach 0. So we found the limit to be 0. So on this question, we are given the function f of x, that's big F of x, equal the integral from 0 to x cubed of sine t squared dt. And in the directions, we're told to find the derivative. So we're looking to find the derivative of this integral. So I could write that as f prime, or I could write it as the derivative with respect to x of this integral here. So when you see it written in this format of the derivative of an integral, um, it brings us to using the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And the second fundamental theorem of calculus deals with this exact situation 
where we're calculating the derivative of an integral. And one of the things we've learned is that these operations are opposites of each other and they cancel each other out. And so what you see is that we get the original function for the answer just evaluated at this upper bound here. So I'm going to talk you through the idea of this um, second fundamental theorem, the basics of how it works, so that we can get an understanding of how to do the problem that we have above. So when we are working out this part in the brackets, we're going to be using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. And the first fundamental theorem of calculus says that we start by finding the antiderivative of this function on the inside, that's big F, of t, and then we evaluate that at the upper bound minus the lower bound. We still have got this derivative on the outside. So using that first fundamental theorem of calculus, we would evaluate at the upper bound minus evaluating at the lower bound. And we still need to calculate that derivative. Now then when we apply the derivative to the first term, we've got the situation where we had the derivative of what the antiderivative was. So remember, f and big F was the antiderivative of lowercase f. So if we're going to calculate the derivative, that means we're going to get back to the lowercase f. And then when we calculate the derivative on this term here, because we're evaluating at a, a is a constant, the derivative of that will be zero. And so that's how we get back to um, that original function evaluated at this upper bound here. So that's the basics of how the second fundamental theorem of calculus works. Now the example that we're working with is a little bit different because our upper bound instead of it just being an x, it's an x cubed. So let's think of it with that x cubed instead. So let me just change. This is our fundamental theorem. And now we're going to have an x cubed instead of an x. So if we're thinking of what's inside the brackets using the second fundamental, excuse me, the first fundamental theorem of calculus, we would do the big F, that's the antiderivative, and we're going to evaluate from A to X cubed, and then we're going to calculate the derivative of that. So when we use the first fundamental theorem of calculus, we're going to evaluate at the bounds to get big F of X cubed minus big F of A, and we still need to calculate the derivative. And this time, when we're calculating the derivative of this term here, we're going to have to use the chain rule. Because this is not just an X on the inside, we have to chain by multiplying by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of this big F will be little f, but then we're going to chain by multiplying by the derivative of the inside, and that's going to be 3x squared. The derivative of this one right here will be still 0 because that's the derivative of a constant. So we end up getting 3x squared f of x cubed. So when we have our bounds being something other than a constant or x, we have to consider the chain rule when applying this um, second fundamental theorem of calculus. So now let's go back to our example. So when we're taking a look at our example, we do have the derivative 
and the antiderivative, these operations will cancel each other out, we want to evaluate at this upper bound. We can ignore the lower bound because it's a constant. But because that upper bound is something other than just x, we do have to use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of the inside. So we're going to get sine. Instead of t, we're going to use x cubed, sine of x cubed squared. And we have to chain by multiplying by the derivative of that upper bound. So that's going to be 3x squared. So we get sine, or maybe we should write our variable first, 3x squared sine of x to the sixth. So this one uses the second fundamental theorem of calculus. But because that upper bound is something other than just x, we have to chain and multiply by the derivative of that upper bound. For this question, we want to evaluate the integral. We've got the integral of e to the x plus sine x plus cosine x plus 1 over x. So each one of these is going to use a different antiderivative rule. And I'm going to write those antiderivative rules on the side. So our antiderivative of e to the x dx is e to the x plus c. The sine and cosine always get me a little bit mixed up, so I go back to the derivative rules for that. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. So that means that the antiderivative of cosine x dx is sine x plus c. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So that means the antiderivative of sine x dx is negative cosine x plus c. And then finally, the integral of 1 over x dx, that's going to be our um, natural log rule. We've got natural log absolute value of x plus c. So these are the rules that we're going to use um, in calculating this antiderivative. We can go term by term. The antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. The antiderivative of sine will be negative cosine x. The antiderivative of cosine will be sine x. The antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log absolute value of x. And we need our plus c for our family of antiderivatives. On this question, we want to evaluate the integral. And this is a definite interval, integral because we have bounds. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at what is inside of my integral. I've got the integral of 0 to 2 of x squared times 2x minus 3. So this is one where if I do a little bit of algebra first, I can break these parentheses up and have individual terms and then calculate the antiderivative using the power rule. So I'll use the distributive property to get the integral of 0 to 2 of 2x cubed minus 3x squared dx. And now that I have individual terms, I'll use the power rule for antiderivatives. And with the power rule, I want to add 1 to the power. Um, 2 is a constant multiple. I carry that down. So I'll add 1 to that power to get 4 and divide by 4. 3 is a constant multiple. I'll carry that down. And I'll add 1 to the 2 to get 3 and divide by 3. And we want to use our first fundamental theorem of calculation calculus and evaluate at the bounds. So I'm going to do a little bit more algebra cleanup before I evaluate. It's always a little bit easier if your expression is in simplest form. So that's going to be x to the fourth over 2 minus x cubed. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 2. 
So we'll do big F of 2 minus big F of 0. That's the antiderivative evaluated at 2 minus the antiderivative evaluated at 0. So that's 2 to the 4th over 2 minus 2 cubed minus I'm putting parentheses because I want to subtract the whole evaluation. That's 0 to the 4th over 2 minus 0 cubed. So 2 to the 4th would be 16. And 2 to the 3rd is 8. All of this is 0. So we have 8 minus 8, which is 0. So we've got this definite integral equaling 0. On this question, we want to evaluate the definite integral. We have the integral from pi over 3 to pi over 2 of co cosecant squared x dx. So we need to know first the antiderivative of cosecant squared, and that is negative cotangent x. And we're going to evaluate that from pi over 3 to pi over 2. So we've got negative cotangent of pi over 2 minus negative cotangent of pi over 3. And let me bring out my unit circle. And pi over 2 is using this point right here. And um, cotangent is x over y. So this is going to be 0 over 1. And then we want to use this point right here for pi over 3. And once again, cotangent is x over y. So we're going to have 1 half over square root of 3 over 2. And so this first term is 0. On the second term, I'll multiply by the reciprocal. That's 1 half times 2 over square root 3. The 2's cancel out, and we get 1 over square root 3. So we could leave the answer like that, but if you prefer to rationalize, then you would multiply by square root of 3 over 3. Oh, sorry, square root of 3 over square root of 3. And that's square root of 3 over square root of 9, which is square root of 3 over 3. So this is also acceptable. So 1 over square root of 3 or rationalize square root of 3 over 3. Use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the limit. The limit as x approaches 0 of e to the x minus 1 over sine x. So first we're going to start by using direct substitution. So I'm going to substitute our limiting value of 0 in for x. We have e to the 0 minus 1 over sine of 0. e to the 0 is 1. And we have in the numerator 1 minus 1, which is 0. In the denominator, I have sine of 0. So I'm thinking of the unit circle with an angle of 0. Sine is the y-coordinate. And the y-coordinate at that point would be 0. So we do have 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form. When we get that indeterminate form, that's what allows us to use L'Hopital's rule. Now, with L'Hopital's rule, what we do is we calculate the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator and then apply the same limit. So it becomes the limit as x approaches 0. The derivative of e to the x minus 1 is e to the x. And the derivative of sine is cosine. So we have cosine x. Now we try to apply the limit again using direct substitution. That gives e to the 0 over cosine of 0. e to the 0 is 1, and cosine at 0 will be now the x-coordinate, which is 1. So we have 1 over 1, which is 1, and we have that this limit equals 1. From this one, we want to use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the limit. We have the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x over x cubed. 
So we're going to start with direct substitution. That will give e to the infinity over infinity cubed. e to the infinity is infinity, and infinity cubed is infinity. So we end up with infinity over infinity, which is an indeterminate form. Remember that indeterminate form, remember, it just means that it's not revealing enough for us to know what the answer is. So we have a little bit more work to do. When we get that indeterminate form, we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule in which we calculate the derivative of both the numerator and denominator individually and reapply the limit. So we're going to reapply this limit as x approaches infinity, calculate the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x, and the derivative of x cubed would be 3x squared. And when we apply that limit, we use direct substitution and get e to the infinity over 3 times infinity squared. This, once again, is infinity over infinity. But hopefully you can see that we can once again apply L'Hopital's rule. And eventually, if we keep taking the derivative enough, this bottom part will not have a variable any longer. So we're going to calculate the derivative again on the numerator and denominator. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. If we apply the limit, we get infinity, e to the infinity is infinity, over 6 times infinity, which is infinity. But one more time, and we get the limit. As x approaches infinity, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of 6x is 6. And now when we apply the limit, we get e to the infinity over 6, which is infinity over 6, which is infinity. So this limit approaches infinity using L'Hopital's rule, repeated iterations of L'Hopital's rule. Thank you for checking out my videos. Have a great day.